Welcome to Casa Malpais Archaeological Roadshow. Hosted by Casa Malpais Archaeological Park and Museum in conjunction with Archaeology Southwest and the Arizona Humanities Council, we wanted to put on this event to allow the people in the local area who may have had artifacts handed down to them through generations that didn't exactly know what they were, a place that they could bring them in and find out more about them. And unlike the antique road show that we see on TV, we will not be discussing financial values of these artifacts, rather using them as a research tool for artifacts found in this area. So you wanna tell me a little bit about this? I found out on uh, my property up in Nutrioso, mm -hmm. and um, that's all that was there, and I crudely put it together. That's about all I can tell you about it. Yeah, so this is a Muggion, what's called a Muggion brownware um, vessel. So this is a, you know, what would be a little cooking pot. You can see kind of some of this uh, smoke mm -hmm. charring on the outside and stuff like that. That's where it would have been exposed to fire when it was cooking. Uh, it's called brownware because the paste on the inside there, like oh, the clay okay. that it's made for is this brown color. And you can kind of see little bits of sand mm -hmm. and things that are in there. And the specific variety of this is what's called indented corrugated. So you can see that corrugated just means that they make it with coils, you know, sort of you coil, coil a vessel and, and build it up from the bottom like that and you leave the coils exposed. And this is indented corrugated because as they were applying each of these coils, they used the side of their finger or their thumb to sort of oh, okay. make these little impressions like this all the way around. And ones like this that are corrugated all the way around uh, the entire vessel, those usually date uh, after about 80, 10, 50. So, and, and you know, as, as late as a, a little after 1300, uh, some in, a little bit later in some places, and down in that area, I imagine this is probably somewhere from about 1050 to 1300, somewhere like that, and then that Nutrioso area. You can see the rim at the top here is sort of just the broken edge right there, and uh, most, most likely this vessel would have had a sort of curved mm -hmm. lip like that, so a little, a neat little cooking pot, Mugion Brownware cooking pot. Most of the artifacts that I have were picked up out of my backyard. Mm -hmm. So, but this I don't think was, so I really don't know where it came from. Yeah, this, this kind of reminds me in some ways of things from in central Arizona and further south, made out of the same material. They're sort of used as agave knives and th things like that. So they'll be used to sort of, you know, take off the leaves and scrape the pulp off the leaves and things like that. And it's made out of the same material and looks a lot similar to that. Yeah, that's what that's that's what I would think it is, and Doug it seems agrees is, agrees okay. as well too. So you know this is more. I'm trying to think of how close to here these have been found. I mean, I, I know there's in the Eber Overgard area there's agave that grow in association with archaeological sites. Mm -hmm. There's sort of remnant populations of agave in that area that are more populous in the areas around archaeological sites than away. And there's that's sort of this high elevation species of agave. It's sort of an interesting phenomenon that people are promoting and things like that. But that, that's what I think this is. Okay. There's a, so a this little platey material. Uh, this discolored streak across here. Mm -hmm. And we were speculating on whether that uh, was tied to something, you know, this uh, discoloration there. Yeah. Or if that's just a discoloration in the rock. I think that's a discoloration in the rock. It does sort of, you know, you can see it follows. There's a little bit different consistency to the surface in that area, so there's a little bit in there, but that's, you know, quite neat. And the way, the way this is sharpened and everything, you know, it very, very may, well may have been hafted in some place back here. And, you know, it's hard to tell on this side because it's broken here, so it's hard to tell how much further around that way, but these are often hafted, you know, and you can use them to sort of cut out the leaves of agave and other tough plants like that where you don't want to get your hands in the spines and things like that. So that's, that's very cool. I live locally. I've worked on the Casa Malpais project, um, cataloging artifacts. So I know what most of these are, but um, I'm curious about a few pieces. These were actually found, unfortunately, youthful enthusiasm and ignorance. I found them in 1976 mm -hmm. after the law was passed, but um, I had no idea there was even a law about it. And they were in the Pariah Wilderness area in the coxcombs. Okay. And I just took some pictures of the site, 
because there was an old, there, these rocks were set along here. Mm -hmm. There was an old campfire uh, that hadn't been used in a while. The grass had grown up around it. Um, and then in this picture, there are lines of rocks going in several directions. Mm -hmm. And so then I didn't even know what to look for as far as an old site, you know, thinking that this might have been used by more modern Indians or whatever. I knew that these were older, but mm -hmm. they were all surface. They were all on the surface. And yeah. uh, the pieces I'm curious about are this. It was found there, and yet there really isn't a whole lot of lava in that area. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of out of context, but I found it with the rest of these. So most of this pottery, this is sort of on the early end of right. painted, painted pottery in this area, and there's a little bit, there's a little bit that goes a little bit later. Probably, right. you know, some of these might be as late as sort of the 81,000 period and things like that. Yeah, corrugated. Yeah. yeah, and so these were all associated together, so this is probably, you know, from mm -hmm. the, this is from the same general area. Yeah, this looks like it's definitely got a groove in it that was made by humans, you know, sharpening right. something, something yeah. in there. And, you know, since the, since the stone has sort of got a good gritty texture and things like that, it would be good for keeping a sharp edge on things like that. So that's more than likely what it is. And a, as you said, you know, if this material mm -hmm. isn't local, then it's something some people brought in probably for that purpose. Right. So there's that's pretty some, interesting. There are some, of course, that whole area is volcanic in some respect or another. Mm -hmm. But this just seemed, since it was with all this other stuff, it just seemed yeah. to fit. <laughs> The, the interesting thing about this, though, is so where exactly was this again? Sorry. In the, the Pariah Wilderness okay. area in the Coxcomb region along the Vermilion Cliffs. Yeah. Right near the edge of the cliffs, actually. Yeah. So this is, this is sort of, you got a lot of pottery in here that we'd sort of call Basket Maker 3 or Pueblo 1 period pottery. Mm -hmm. So th these are various, there's actually several different types here. But you also have some of this corrugated pottery where you have the exposed mm -hmm. coils like that. And that, that's a little bit later than most of the painted ceramics that are here. So this might have been a site that was used mm -hmm. multiple times over a long time. And the pictures that you showed me there, the architectural features also look like sort of early storage shifts, cysts mm -hmm. and things like that, that people would build. Um, yeah, or, or maybe a hunting site. Yeah, exactly. And, some, and some, of those, some of those stone alignments and things like that might have even been there. It's hard to tell what mm -hmm. the slope is like, but sort of divert water and things like that. That's something right. common, especially when you have those linear alignments of rocks. Oh, okay. And things yeah. like that. Not necessarily that they built a structure then, but that, or that there was a Pueblo there, but yeah. well, possibly I, I, just a shelter or, or a drainage. Yeah. yeah, the other, the other photo certainly does look like a structure of some, of some kind. Mm -hmm. And just those, those, the you know, yeah, yeah. The, the linear alignments of stones there. Mm -hmm. Given that they're on that slope like that, could be something for sort of spreading water out on a field after the rains. You know, the water flows down and those features kind of mm -hmm. let it percolate into the soil where they'd be growing food and things like that. So, okay. you have another piece here? Um, yeah, I have a couple about? of others. This one I'm pretty sure at one point was used for smoothing. It was in a yeah. riverbed uh, near, it was like in a, a wash that would have come off mm -hmm. of this nearby. But it's uh, got lime, to, I mean it's so old, it's got lime on it. Yeah. Yeah, so sort of a tool right. used for smoothing and things like and that. And this also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another one. That one's actually got a really nice. That's got a really nice edge to it. Yeah, yeah. and you it's can really obvious. tell how, how much that's been worked. Yeah. So over over a very long yeah. period of time, you know, on all sides, it's sort of it's been used in many different directions, mm -hmm. and it's about you know it's a good size for being held in the hand like that. You know, you could kind of imagine right. how it would and be used. And that's what I I thought about this one too. The way these two. Uh, yeah, you mm -hmm. know the the rock itself. I don't know if that was deliberate or if the rock just happened to be that way. But it looks like to to me like someone actually did sort of take another piece off of that. So this was sort mm -hmm. of you know they worked it into the shape. This one might have you know because it, it is broken there and that's sort of a fresher break. So it might yeah. have extended around and been about the same shape as this, where it's sort of D-shaped mm -hmm. with one mm -hmm. flat side and then the three rounded sides. Well, this was interesting too. Um, I found this, and it was also kind of out of place, but I mm -hmm. thought it it almost looked like something that had been carried around in somebody's pocket, but I'm not real sure. Yeah, that's a fossil of some sort. I don't know exactly what it is. Yeah, it almost looks <coughs> like um, a piece of lava got wrapped around a walnut mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then burned, like something like that. burned the walnut out and exploded yeah. with the little hole. I mean, that was just my idea anyway. And then again, you know, 
yeah. if, if this isn't sort of a volcanic landscape immediately right there, it probably some people place, brought in. Yeah. yeah. And then this, I, I think it's just a shirt or, mm -hmm. or like a, not a shirt, a um, fracture on a, yeah. a spald. Yeah. A spald. But it's just really weird looking. Yeah, a nice, you can imagine sort of a big yeah. round kind of river rolled thing and one spall comes off right there. Yeah. It's pretty nice. It's it, without, you know, you're missing the piece that would allow you to tell whether someone, someone used did it that or intentionally, not. Yeah. you know, because if, if, mm -hmm. if it were going a little bit further up, you'd be able to sell if it were intentionally broken off. Right. A larger piece, but you have sort of just this, you know. Just the rough area. The rough area. And, yeah, yeah it's hard there. to tell if it's ever been used or not. Mm -hmm. Anyway, these are just bigger pieces of pottery. These yeah. are, they, they don't look like they, these ever had a glaze on them, like, and they have like a deposit in, I don't know, maybe yeah. they were water jugs, but. Yeah. Anyway, it's just More than brown likely. ware or something like that. I think these are gray ware. Gray ware. Actually, yeah, and so yeah. this probably would have been a bowl. I actually think that was, mm -hmm. so the rim you can imagine yeah, about bigger. that big, mm -hmm. based on the side. Yeah. And this, yeah, again, this was all from the same area. And then yeah. the other other piece, does this is this a meteorite? Have you ever seen? Oh, you know, I I wouldn't, wouldn't be the know. one to tell you about that. But I to me, this seems like sort of a, a churdy sort of stone. Okay. So, I don't think. so it it could have been. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. It just looks so odd compared mm -hmm. to everything else. And then that, oh, I I just had found this and I thought it was probably an, a tool of opportunity. I mean, more, yeah. more, more recently than now that I've learned a little bit <laughs> because it doesn't look, appear to have been purposely shaped except that I found that if you uh, use this, mm -hmm. yeah, kind of like that and you cut, it is very sharp, it cuts. Yeah, and that's- And the edge has been worked. That's pretty that typical side. of lithics from that area where a lot of them are pretty expedient things that they just make yeah. for one or two uses. Well, thanks, so, thanks so much for bringing this in. This is all really interesting stuff. So um, This is actually from a different place. This is from Texas. Texas, okay. Yeah, and this was uh, in the, you know, when they build bridges across the creeks, there's a rubble pile that comes down from the, mm -hmm. from the road, and um, this had rolled down into the creek that, you know, what had from the, the mm -hmm. rubble pile, and so apparently it had just been bulldozed in there. Yeah. So I was just curious. It's it's basically like an old, would have been an old round grinding tool, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a limestone, like you said before, yeah. and you can kind of see the pecking on the inside and then how this has been yeah. smooth in there. So, you know, kind mm -hmm. of more of a crushing sort of thing than a grinding Oh, yeah, thing. okay, so mm -hmm. like more like yeah. a pounding? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, well, thank yeah. you very much. Well, thanks so much, it was good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for bringing all this stuff in. Do you want to tell me a little bit about what you know about this and it was in his father's things <laughs> Kevin said they've been there um, most of his life where he acquired them uh, we're not really sure I think they came out of maybe Mexico mm -hmm. other than that we do not know a lot about it yeah so you know you're showing looking at these photos and also the additional contents of the box that aren't on the table here mm -hmm. a lot of these things are Mexican um, you know, I'm not a Mex I'm not, I don't work in Mesoamerica in Mexico, so I don't know a lot of the specifics on that, but I can tell you a little bit about that. And I, d I can recognize some of the sort of design motifs and things as, as Mexican, especially some of these figurine fragments you have there and some of these, you know, the effigy pots that have, you know, people's faces or animals' faces and things on them. Mm -hmm. They're all really interesting. So th this is sort of an interesting one here, a turtle pot of some sort, you know, and you mind if I pick this up? and bring it a little closer. See, so it had a little bit of a red slip, so sort of a thin clay put on the outside to make it sort of, have it, give it sort of this red color. So I imagine when this was freshly fired, it probably would have had a nice red hue, similar to that all the way around. It's a nice thick vessel and build, building something like this that has a hollow inside and also these legs, that's pretty difficult. It takes a pretty skilled potter to do that kind of thing without making it explode in the kiln, you know, because especially when you have these kind of attached pieces and all these little applique is what they call this on, on top of that it can be it can be difficult to uh, to keep that intact throughout the firing process and you know another interesting thing is this vessel has a lot of different um, a lot of different techniques are applied to the to the construction of this so you know it, they have these sort of applique mm -hmm. pieces and all this and actually you can see the eyes 
and the mouth were scored on, you know, probably on sort of clay that's kind of leather hard. They let it dry a little bit and then sort of score that on there. And you can see a little bit of the paint oh, on the leg. It was more decorated there. then. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. And you can see this sort of <coughs> clouding, this like this was burned, and you'd mentioned that it, so it had been in a fire, yeah. So that, that could be a product of that as well. Mm -hmm. Some of these others, you know, these are nice small vessels. Also, you know, these plain, plainware things like this can often be difficult to determine if you're not sort of a specialist in the area where they came from and you don't know sort of specifically about that. But again, it's got this sort of unique shoulder where you can see, you know, it's sort of a bowl with a round mouth and then they added this. And oftentimes when you're going to make a vessel like that, you'll actually form this bowl portion first mm -hmm. and then let that dry a little bit. And then you can add this slowly by sort of adding coils of clay. You roll little snakes of clay and coil them out and, and, into making the pot like that. This one, oh, Do sorry. these seem like they are from Southwest area? Um, these don't, that I'm, no. I'm seeing here. This one does though. So mm -hmm. this, this one right here, this is what's called an indented corrugated jar. Mm -hmm. Looking at the paste and the color, this is what I would call a uh, Tucson um, grayware. So these are kind of common in northern Arizona, um, throughout lots of different portions of northern Arizona. And because you've got the base there, you can actually see how they started building the coils and sort of wrapped it in a spiral going from the outside. You know, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're adding more coils. And as they add um, additional coils, they're pinching them together, making these little indentations. And these, these are quite fine indentations. So you can see, you know, my finger's too big to do that, you know. So, so they're, they're real fine work, real fine coil. So this is, you know, takes a skilled potter mm -hmm. to, to do this sort of thing. And this, this style where you have this all over corrugation, where it's corrug corrugated all the way from the bottom and indented all the way from the bottom to the top, mm -hmm. usually dates after about AD 1050. So yeah, so this is sort of, you know, 1050 to about maybe 1300 or possibly a little bit later. So somewhere in that general range. Mm. So that's really interesting. And again, it's sort of a squat little vessel form. So this might have been some sort of storage vessel or something like that rather than a cooking pot because, you know, those would typically be, have a little bit different form. Right. You can see these. This one again, I'm not sure the origin of this, but, you know, sort of a nice brown clay coiled on the outside. And you can kind of see in this one little broken bit that there's some white fragments in there that might be bits of rock or sand that are in the, that were added to the clay when they were producing the vessel. You can see again a red paint on the outside and this could either be another color of paint. It's hard, it's hard to tell, but there could be a second color of paint on there. So a little painted bowl with a painted interior. Mm -hmm. This one. Yeah, this one's actually kind of interesting because you can see how much thicker the base is than the rest of the vessel. So they have this nice little slab base and then it's built up and you can actually if you look at this one in the right light, I'm kind of seeing the finger, you know, impressions of as, as that was formed was around really from the outside. You can, you can kind of see they're about evenly spaced, mm -hmm. you know, for a few as, as the hand would be I see what applied you're from now. the outside I never of that. noticed that before. Yeah, no, so that's really neat. Mm -hmm. Well, so this is great, interesting stuff. And yeah, I mean, from most of these pictures um, and a few of the items that you brought in today, like, like I said, this is, this is southwestern and probably from, you know, general northern Arizona area. And mo a lot of these are Mesoamerican, you know, Mexico or Central American. Some may even be South American, which is pretty interesting. So yeah. it's a great collection of stuff. I remember old, old guys and, and old trucks would come into my dad's ranch and sell off pieces and parts. And mm -hmm. There used to be a lot larger collection over the years, but this is what's uh, survived. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, thanks for bringing this in. Yeah, you bet. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, welcome. You want to tell us a little bit about the items you brought here? Well, this is uh, Hohokam. It's from Plowed Field, um, right north of the Gila River at Florence, and um, it's made out of malpai. Mm -hmm. And this stone is from actually the it's in the Turkey Mountains east mm -hmm. of Las Vegas, New Mexico. Okay. And uh, they're both surface finds. I found yeah. them both, and I'd like to know what they are. 
Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I can about them. So, so this first one, kind of the Florence area, it's made out of a volcanic basalt, like a real porous basalt. It's actually pretty light, Yes. given its size. And you can see all these little vesicles and stuff that formed as, as the stone was forming. So it's a volcanic stone that sort of cools at a, at a, at a um, slow to moderate rate. And you know, it's, it's definitely been shaped into this sort of Y thing, which you can't really imagine any sort of functional reason for that, especially when it's you know, made out of such a brittle material that it wouldn't really last for any sort of grinding or pounding or anything like that. So this is probably something that was made just to sort of have this unique shape. You know, I haven't seen one specifically like this, so I can't tell you much more than what you already kind of know about this, but it was, it was probably sort of, you know, used in some sort of ceremonial context perhaps or something like that. And, you know, the Florence area, there's a lot of large Hoacom sites mm -hmm. in that general area. So in, in you know, the, the sites in that area run from all the way from the earliest sort of irrigation communities all the way until the end of the classic period around 1450. So there's a pretty large date range for what could be associated with this. But that's, that's kind of unique. I mean, that Y shape, you know, it's almost like a little triangle. That's really interesting. This one is sandstone, um, and it's a really cool sandstone too because it's got yeah. the different colors, the sort of white and red bands and things like that. And it's really, really well smoothed. This, this is, you know, just a perfect smooth down to a point that's almost, you can almost see like a little light reflection in there. You know, it's so smooth, so bright on the end there. And then, you know, it's got this little notch around the top, and it even looks like it had something pecked in there. And there's a little break that happened at some time after, after it was produced. But that's interesting. And, you know, that area is kind of on, east of Las Vegas is kind of a little bit outside of the typical area that is considered sort of the Southwest. And, you know, there's the famous saying that the Southwest goes from Las Vegas New Mexico to Las Vegas, Nevada, and from Durango, Colorado to Durango, Mexico. That's sort of, you know, a, a cute way of saying, you know, what we kind of consider, and, th and this would be sort of the edge of this. So this is the far edge of the Southwest on the edge of the plains. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're sort of out in the mountains in the areas in between the agricultural communities that were living in the, in the, in the uh, Southwest and some of the more mobile groups that were living east of there. So this is sort of an, an interesting area. I don't recognize the specific form or anything, but it, yeah, I mean, that, that there is, you know, the sandstone landscape is in that area would reproduce these kinds of banded materials. So it could be, could have been made with materials from the, within the general vicinity. But yeah, I wish I could tell you more about that, but that's a little outside of my, my area. Okay, so. so we don't know what it was made, used for. Don't know what, what it was purpose? used for. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've seen, I've, I've seen similar things with this, with this little ridge that it, that might've been used to sort of tie it, you know, there, yeah. there could have been something around that so it could have it could have been used you know well, in in the in the hohokam there's this similar shape mm -hmm. what did they use it for well there's there's a few different things like and there's there's the different parts of the southwest where they use these as sort of like pendant like things or pieces of clothing or things like that for certain kinds of ceremonies and things like that this is quite large you know in relation to some of those that's that's really interesting occasionally an event like this one produces a collection of artifacts that the Native Americans deemed too sacred to photograph or put on display. Such was the case with a collection of artifacts that came in along with this 10 to 12,000 year old Clovis point. Since the roadshow, this Clovis point has been donated to the Casa Malpais Museum, so it is there now for the public to enjoy as well as archaeologists and historians to study for research. And uh, we live outside of St. John's, Apache County, 40-acre um, area, mm -hmm. loaded with petroglyphs, et cetera. And there are numerous rock niches at the top of Mesa, and uh, there are shelters, boulders, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Something like this just happened to be inside, just sitting up in a rock, a little stone on top of it. So which direction from St. John's did you say? Uh, southeast. Southeast, okay. So along the, yeah. along the wash there, the, the Carrizo wash. What do you call, yeah, I guess mm -hmm. part of it, uh, mm -hmm. Mesa Parada. Yeah, okay. That area, Salt Lake Road. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I help yourself? Yeah.
This is a nice little corrugated vessel. It looks like it wasn't in that many pieces either. There's just, actually, so you found this? Found it as, as is. is. Okay, yeah. One of the rocks had yeah. looked like it had fallen so that you could see inside the niche where it was in there. Yeah, no, that's really what, and it's just got this one little crack running there, but it's, yeah, basically intact. It's got a few little hairline fractures all the way around it. But, so I'm gonna look in this paste here to s sort of see a little bit more about the clay and how it was produced. And you can see it's got this, this sort of brown paste with the little bits of sand and stuff. I don't know if you can see that up close, those little white bits that are mm -hmm. in there and the sort of clear bits or little bits of quartz sand. So this is, this is a, um, what I'd call a Muggion brownware vessel corrugated vessel. And this area is a kind of interesting because you're kind of right on the edge between where brownware, Muggion brownware is common and where grayware, things like Siebel or grayware are common. So you're sort of in this edge that is possibly a, you know, cultural transition zone, but also a geological transition zone where the materials that are available for making mm -hmm. vessels. And actually this one sort of has some features that are similar to both brown and grayware. So it's sort of an interesting combination of things. And so, you know, we call this a corrugated vessel because it starts with that spiral of coils. So they sort of make a little snake with clay and start spiraling it up. And you can see from the bottom there, you can even see the direction. You know, it's going clockwise when you're looking down to the bottom. Yeah. And they're adding these, adding these coils together. And as they, as they add each individual coil, they're, you know, pinching them together. And when they're pinching them, they're making these little indentations all the way around. And the coils on this are pretty fine. You know, some of them are actually quite small. And, you know, the indentations are quite small. And I'm actually seeing you can see fingerprints in a couple of them, which is always interesting to me because you can actually see, you know, the fingerprints of the potter. You know, that's kind of amazing just to think that, you know, that's, that's been preserved in that way. And, you know, the fact that this has been preserved intact as well. So since it has this, this indented corrugations, mm -hmm. what, what these indentations all the way around, and they go all the way up the vessel, that sort of tells us a little bit about when this was made. So this, this was made after about 80, 1050 in the region. So, th so this, is, this is probably, you know, anywhere from 1050 to maybe the early 1300s. So somewhere, somewhere in that time period. And in the St. John's area, there's a lot of sites that date in that general time period, you know, so you're, you're sort of white, right within that range. And it looks like the rim was slightly chipped, but, you know, it's worn over that place where it's chipped. So that probably happened quite a long time ago. You know, mm -hmm. you can almost imagine some, you know, a lid or something sitting on top of it like that would, would do that. And you can, it would curve out just a little bit further. And you know, something like this, you don't really see any um, severe burning on the outside or anything like that. You can actually see those bits of sand temper oh, yeah. in the side there really, really well where it's going on there. So a little storage jar, possibly a little, you know, small cooking jar, things like that. And with the, you know, evidence that it sort of had something capping on it, I think, you know, it was we, probably we used for storage. You had a sandstone yeah. lid sandstone for it. Yeah. It. You can tell exactly where that was, you know, because th that's sort of a characteristic thing where you get this flattened rim, you know, like that. So th th that's quite interesting. And, you know, like, like I was saying, the, the, sands, the St. John's area um, is in that transition zone between the areas that are almost exclusively the muggy on brimware and the areas that are almost exclusively the Siebel or Grayware. So they're, they're sort of right in that transition zone. And the interesting thing about this one is it has some, you know, it's, it's made with the, the, the brown clay, but it has some characteristics mm -hmm. that are a little bit more similar to the grayware pottery, given like how these indentations are due, like how the, how, how the hand is held when the indentations are produced in the coil. So it's an interesting, you know, something that's real characteristic of that area. And the fact that it's intact is just incredible, you know, so that's, that's really great. Yeah, the rocks were all around it. Yeah. You, you know, you never just know what will What's be where? preserved. Yeah. Right. That's um, really amazing. So you feel it's more a storage or cooking or? Yeah, I think th it's probably a storage jar is what it was being used for most recently, at least, especially since you found that sandstone lid. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's evidence, this wear around the outside that that had been the way it was being used for a little while. So, you know, th these, these kinds of things, they'd store seeds and things like that in. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that's great. That's all that's inside was a little bit of dirt. Yeah, yeah. So, so whatever the contents were are gone, but, yeah. we can't you know. Be dirt. Yeah, no, no, I, I can see that. That's good. You, the dirt's still in, in there. Just in case it had a purpose. <laughs> yeah, no, there's little bits of vegetal material and stuff in there. It might, it's good, it's good to keep it all together, you know. Oh, okay. So, well, that's great. Great. 
you see this on this color, the sort of like grayish color mm -hmm. on that side. And so, so sort of the, the paste yeah. is this, some, sometimes in this area they call this gray brown. You know, I'm, I'm sort of talking about that being that combination of things in that area. So this, this is sort of, it has characteristics of both the gray wear and the brown wear. So hmm. that's interesting. My name's Greg Cross, and I brought some items in from a friend of mine, Roxanne Knight, who's a local area resident for a long time here. And she was unable to attend, so she asked me to bring these in and see what she could find out about them. So this first thing I have, both of these items I'll be showing here were given to her. She owns a motel in the area by uh, people that stayed at her motel and, and left them for her. So. Mm -hmm. She's really curious to find out what this might be. Yeah, these are, these are really interesting. So th there's a few archaic dart points in here, these large dart points. So these, are, these would be hafted and used on long uh, throwing darts, you know, so you use them with an atlatl, what's called, oh, okay. you know, so you, you uh -huh. have the staff going like that. And two of these things are really particularly interesting. One right here is this object that's made out of this chert material that is in the shape of a horny toad, right. which is, th that's, that's just really amazing to me. That's a, sort of an interesting sort of thing. We sometimes call these kinds of objects eccentrics when they're stone objects that are chipped into a shape like that. And there's also this crescent right here that's also quite interesting. So um, <clears throat> those, those objects, we just actually sent a couple of photos of those to a colleague at uh, uh, Arizona State Museum, Alan Ferg. And he was saying that there's similar things like this have been recovered at Snake Town in the Phoenix area. So th these, oh. and, and also, you know, this being sort of Sonoran animal and things like that, you can think, so these, these may have come up here from Southern Arizona. So that's, that's pretty interesting that she has these, but these are both really unique objects. I mean, that crescent is really, really finely made. You can imagine, yes. you know, chipping, chipping that and not, you know, making any mistakes or anything like that. And it's got, it's really consistent in profile. It's flat from one side to the next, and that takes an extreme amount of skill. And you know, this this is just really neat to me. You know, because you can really, even though it just has a few features, you can really tell, you know, the animal that it is and things like that. So th those are both really neat objects. And then once again, these were just left mm -hmm. by one of the her customers. So these are interesting. So there's there's sort of a lot of ceramics in here, and then several different um, stone. Uh, dart and arrow points and they're sort of a range of time periods for the stone arrow points like these some of these corner notched ones here are basket maker points so they're sort of from the basket maker time period mm -hmm. there was one I saw earlier there's actually one uh, earlier point in here um, yeah San Jose point that has this little sort of u-shaped base like that and several of these other, you know, large bifaces and things like that. So th these sort of run the gamut from through the middle and late archaic, and then there's even a few sort of the later basket maker points. And then some of these small obsidian points, you know, made out of this volcanic glass are mm -hmm. arrow points. That, so they'd have to on arrows instead of darts, and those are much smaller and a little bit later. So that this, it's sort of an interesting array of things, most of which are made out of volcanic materials. So there's a lot of obsidian. There's a few things that are sort of basalt. Uh, and a few other objects of chert around the edges here. So it's really an array of things that are characteristic of a long span of time in, in, in this part of the Southwest and elsewhere. The pottery, uh, for the most part, seems to be pretty consistently uh, date to a, about one time period. So the, for the most part, the redware vessels, I wonder if I can take this off, it's disconnected. These redware vessels here, so this, this has white paint on sort of a brownish w white uh, red surface in there. And, and it's got this really, really dark smudging on the inside. So then this is sort of a white on red that's typical of this area. But then, oh, I didn't even know there was polychrome on the inside of that mm -hmm. one as well. So this one's got black paint on a red slip with white outlining and white on the outside. So this would be a St. John's polychrome. But sort of having this white outlining on the inside, like that's a late characteristic. So sort of after about 1250, that's more common. Um, okay. And then a lot of this whiteware is what's known as Tularosa black on white, which is a late Cibola whiteware. It dates from about 1175 to 1300. And for the most part, that's what these items are. So St. John's polychrome and Tularosa black on white. So it's, it's sort of in a range of what we call the Pueblo III period, 
um, that would be pretty typical of this area. And a lot of this, this pottery has been shown to have been made locally in this area. And also some of it would come in from the areas around Zuni. Uh, so they were exchanging with people along that area. But yeah, this is a great collection of local materials. Could you hold them up? Please? Sure, I should put the glass back on. Okay. Okay. Well, so we just put, put these to the side. Okay. Now the next two items came off of Roxanne's property, mm -hmm. and uh, see how it's that. Okay. So this is a little Siebel of Whiteware pitcher. It kind of has a unique design. It doesn't sort of fit the typical design traditions, but given the slip the hardness of the slip and the color of the paint and the thickness of the vessel and things. I'd say this is probably either Pueblo II or Pueblo III period, so probably between about 1050 and the late 1200s. And you can see these white fragments and the gray paste there. So there's uh -huh. a gray paste and all those white fragments are bits of broken up ceramic sherd. So one of the characteristics of Siebel whiteware is it'll crush up sherd and, and crush up quartz sand, sandstone, and they'll you mix that with clays that come from the sandstone, whether out of the sandstone mostly, and they'll make the paste out of that. So it's really distinctive, and you can often see those white fragments, and they're, they're bits assured. It's painted with a min mineral paint that gives it this nice, hard black lines on there. And this, this is an interesting little, you know, handled pitcher. And something like this, you know, could be used to um, transport water for storage or things like that. So th this is a, not an uncommon size for these, and you can actually see that even though it's quite narrow, they did a good job of smoothing all the way mm -hmm. to the bottom on the inside. So you imagine, you know, the size of your hand <laughs> <laughs> to kind of have to work around on that, but they did a pretty good job. And you can actually see through, through some of these areas how uh, the vessel was built up because you can see a few exposed coils. So this was made by uh -huh. building up coils, you know, little pottery snakes and then winding them up and actually smoothing them all out from the outside and inside. So it's a neat little vessel. It's got some painting on the handle too, which is kind of kind of interesting. And this last one here, this is sort of a unique thing. So this is made of bone, a little pendant, and it's got a hole drilled so that you can see. And it's actually got in relief what looks to be a bighorn sheep. Right. So there's a bighorn sheep with, it actually has a, quite a distinct eye and horns and two legs sticking up in front of it like that. That's, that's interesting. And being in relief like that, that's, that's kind of unique. I haven't seen one like that. There's, there's pendants from this part of the Southwest that are often three-dimensional three representations of an animal and things like this. But this one having this in relief is kind of unique. It's a little bit different than what I've seen around here. So the, that, that's quite interesting. And I noticed in the museum in there, you have a bighorn sheep skull. Yes. Yeah, so they, they were in this area in small numbers uh, pre prehistorically, mm -hmm. even though they're not really, I, I guess there aren't many around now. Uh, there is there's, a herd south there of is here. A, there's a herd south of here, okay. So that's interesting. Yeah, this is a great piece. And I, th I think the fact that, you know, this is in relief rather than yeah, three-dimensional is what, what's really kind of unique about this and, and really different. And it's, it's the artistry and the work on this is pretty amazing as well. Well, thanks for well, bringing thanks. these in, yeah. Thank you. This is interesting stuff. I'm, I'm Andy Marshall. I'm a site steward in this area. And this is Channa Gray. She's also a site steward. And we have uh, photographs of an object we found one day while we were doing our site steward visit at Sherwood Ranch Pueblo. It was found on the north slope, somewhat down the slope from the edge of what the Pueblo had been. It was lying there, sticking out of the ground uh, for all to see. And I uh, took um, photos with my cell phone. And <laughs> yes, and showed them to Doug at the next time he was here. And he recommended that we bury it on the site free of erosion, uh, which we did. And just at the time that we did that, we took these images and have now thought that this was the appropriate time for the images to come out and our story about how it was discovered and what it looks like to us having seen it in, in reality 
as well as the interpretation of the images from and anybody here. Mm -hmm. I say the date somewhere. We estimate it was around August of 2009. Was and then we contacted Doug right away. And he said, "Should we bury it?" So that's what we did. And We've just been mums the word since then. <laughs> it's in a secure location ever since. <laughs> yeah, well, th that's great. And thanks for bringing these photos. And you know, that's exactly what you want to do is, you know, leave it, leave it in the field intact in the location it came from. We can learn so much more about it, you know, and take, take only pictures, leave only footprints. Is exactly. Sort of thing. So that, that's exactly right. And you even, you know, used a penny for scale in the photos, which is great. So we have, you know, a good idea. It took lots of different angles. So th this is terrific. I'm glad. And we must say that our site steward <coughs> training was very appropriate and instrumental yeah. in how we wanted Handle to manage this. Situation. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what we need more of that happening out there, out there in, in, the, in the world. So this is a really interesting object. I, I hadn't seen these pictures before. It's, you know, kind of difficult to determine exactly what it is based on the shape. It's got sort of this area here is sort of a worn surface. That's yes, not that looked like it was intentional. <coughs> mm -hmm. it, so it gave well. I'll let you interpret yeah. first visually before we give our firsthand uh, thoughts on it. Well, I'm I'm kind of seeing an ear and an eye. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what we is saw. what I see here. So, so maybe an effigy of a that's what we thought human face. But there's also this interesting little part on the top mm -hmm. here, and I can't tell if, if there was something that. That's a was, clear break. Was broken there, so there was a, something extending from the when top. You see that you see that is a break. Yeah, something had broken. It's hard to you know identify the specific wear without seeing the temper, but I see some white paint. It looks like red paint, right? As well, so it's polychrome, black, black, white, and red. Mm -hmm. At the very least, there. And Someone suggested that it might have been a white slip, and this is mm -hmm. a portion of it, and it had all mostly worn off. Yeah, no, th I, I agree that that's definitely a white slip. And you see this little pattern where you have these little dots in between these lines. And that's something that you actually see that motif where it's the dots inside the squares on a lot of pottery from sort of the late 1200s and on mm -hmm. in the area. So that, that's sort of interesting. And the polychrome color scheme, too, is, again, you know, something that's sort of on the later end of thing, things in this, this general area. So, you know, my best guess is that this probably postdates the 1200s, which makes makes sense. You know, it's the 1200s or later, mm -hmm. which makes sense given where it was located. Yeah, that's the it, it's interesting on the inside too. Yeah, it's you very can, clear. Yeah, you can took really those see photos on purpose. You can really see sort of almost are those impressions in the coils? Is that what that's we're seeing what it there? Yeah. Like. It, it really I gave the appearance of coils. Yeah. That's what I thought when I first saw it. Yeah, so this, this photo really shows that well. So the coil production, it's painted on the front side and the back side. You can see, see the individual little ridges in there as the coils were applied and squeezed together. So you can see how it was built up from this side up. So it's really interesting. And then uh, we also <coughs> were wondering possibly if it didn't originate there, if it was possibly a trade, a trading situation as to how it arrived there. Well, there's, there's been a few sort of, if, if this is sort of a human image, there's, there's been a few found in this general area. Yeah. There was, there's uh, one recorded in the St. John's area over 100 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, the, these, these kinds of objects, these effigies are uncommon in this part of the Southwest, but they are known, you know, as, of humans. There's a lot of animal images and things right, like that, or right. handles of jars and things like this. But yeah, this, this would be really interesting. And also the fact that this is sort of, built up in this way with the hollow inside and had all these sort of appendages that were applied. Mm -hmm. That's a, you know, I mean, that takes a really skilled potter to do that and build that up in that way. So that's really interesting. The, it's, it's hard to tell, you know, in this photo, but a lot of the consistency of the uh, white that looks like it's sort of eroding away a little bit, it sort of seems chalky. Do you remember mm -hmm. the white being a little chalky like that kind of? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And it was actually less apparent <clears throat> when we Visually looked saw. at it, yeah. uh, this photo had gone through Photoshop to be enhanced to get the details out just a little bit. Yeah, okay. So uh, it, it actually appears in some way a little more clear here yeah. in this image. You can barely see it before. That's what, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a little difficult to, to tell um, with the photo alone, but sort of <coughs> the consistency of that slip reminds me of a lot of things called Salado Polychrome or Roosevelt Redware Vessels. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
which would have sort of this you know color scheme with the red slip and portions, the white slip and portions, and the black paint. You know, I wouldn't be 100% certain on that with, without, you know, holding it in my hand but in, in seeing the paste and color and things like that. But it's sort of interesting, the chalkiness to the white that shows up in these, these images. Would it be possible for us to um, find a way to um, research the other images from the Roosevelt area and yeah. from this area for a visual comparison between this and what other ones actually are known in, in the historical record? Yeah, no, I, I think that'd be a good way to go is to look at images of these effigy vessels and compare it to what you have here, mm -hmm. you know, and, and see if you can find something to relate, you know, relate to what you, what, what you guys found. And, you know, again, it's, it's great that you guys took these great photos from all different angles and kept it in the field and the artifact, you know, stays with the site, the context is preserved and, mm -hmm. you know, that's the best possible outcome for this kind of thing, so. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, sites are good site stewards. <laughs> Thank you for joining us at our first Archaeology Roadshow here in Springerville, Arizona. We had so much fun and learned so much from this event that we're planning to hold another one next summer. And we hope you will join us at that time.